Hi guys, this is Leslie Xavier from the News Click Studio in New Delhi. The World Cup is on, a rousing start and uh, there have been some amazing goals on the ground and there have been some interesting stuff happening, upsets, good victories. And we have our guy in Russia covering the uh, tournament for us, for News Click, Siddhant Anis on ground zero, so to speak, and uh, we'll be connecting with him now to talk about the initial bits that have been happening in the tournament and how things have been shaping up there. So, Siddhant, how are things been the first week in Russia when the big festival is happening? It's been, it's been interesting, like you said, uh, Leslie, obviously everyone, the whole world is following what's happening on the field uh, in terms of the surprise results that we've seen yesterday's uh, win that Mexico had over Germany was, was a big one. Um, Argentina, uh, Iceland getting a point of Argentina, all of these things. So, so I mean, of course, everyone's following what's happening on the field. Um, Russia as a country, I suppose I haven't been all over and, and it's very difficult to speak kind of generically about the country because it's so huge. And I mean, from Kaliningrad <coughs> on one end uh, to Ekaterinburg on the other, it's like several thousands of kilometers. So it's extremely difficult to speak generically, but uh, maybe it's taking a while for the country to also kind of warm up to the atmosphere, to, to, to the football uh, as such. Uh, but slowly we can see more and more fans are coming to the various uh, Russian cities where their teams are playing. So it's it's a good international flavor to it. Um, yeah, it's started off pretty well, I'd, I'd say. And in terms of organization and things like that, of course, uh, I think the Russians are pretty good at putting mega events together, especially something like this, which uh, the government right from the top uh, has treated as a major PR kind of exercise uh, to put the space of new Russia forward, uh, as it were. The infrastructure is in place. The cities are very, very capable of handling the kinds of crowds that are coming in, that, that are expected for the World Cup. So overall, it's a pretty, pretty relaxed uh, vibe here. Uh, in terms of the football, we, the Portugal Spain game was fantastic. I mean, the uh, it was billed as one of the big games of the first stage, and and it lived up to the expectations in in every way. Um, Cristiano Ronaldo staking claim um, once again, I guess, in the big debate about who the best player in the world is. Uh, so uh, I guess starting with a hat trick isn't isn't the worst thing that can happen. So I, he's one nil up as far as that, that little battle with Messi is concerned. So there, uh, like you mentioned, Russia, the new Russia has a very big stake, um, it's a very big thing at stake in, in, in this tournament. Uh, because they haven't uh, organized any major event as such in the recent past. So, but how are the people looking at it? I mean, do they understand what's at stake? What is at stake for them, for, I mean, in other words, the normal Russian? It's a complicated question, uh, but uh, this is, again, from my very limited understanding of, of and from what I've gathered from the people that I've met here. Uh, most Russians don't really care about what's happening outside. They, their country is big enough, they have enough wealth, enough resources, enough work, enough uh, whatever they need to continue to live their lives in whatever manner they choose to. So as far as what is at stake for Russians is concerned, I don't think they think very much is at stake. Um, uh, some people are pissed off because their money is being spent to host this tournament when they feel that it could be much better utilized for other things. For example, Russians, common Russians, working class Russians, guys who are like uh, helping me to uh, set up interviews, meet people, etc., acting as my translators here, for example. Uh, 
they don't know why the price of diesel keeps going up it's very similar to the conversations that are happening in india if this country is so rich uh, and has such a wealth of natural resources etc why do common people have to spend more and more on items that they require as necessities why are salaries of teachers for example much lower than salaries for government employees working in public sector gas companies so these are the kind of conversations that russians are interested in having not not so much about uh, about the world cup yeah they do feel that uh, having so many foreign journalists and foreign tourists coming to their country is a good thing because they uh, because it's an opportunity to maybe uh, get rid of some of the stereotypical constructs of russian society that that exist in sort of popular discourse based on what we read from largely a western media perspective so that, that is something that russians are interested in changing they don't really care i mean they are happy for you to continue to believe that you know there are bears all over the country and everyone just sits around drinking vodka all day <laughs> but if any positive is to be taken out of this entire carnival it is that people will really get a chance to meet real russians and have some real conversations and uh, get to know the country a little bit more holistically or more i don't know in more real terms talking about real russians uh, and talking about the action on the pitch opening day was quite a thing for russia i'm sure a lot of real russians turned i mean 11, 11 real russians turned up on the ground for them what was the uh, reaction among fans after that great start to the tournament for their home team yeah i think they needed it uh, they needed to uh, announce or what russia um, has had a bad run of form uh, in terms of the national team's results over the past well quite some time particularly even in the world cup so they needed a, a sort of a statement victory and then they were lucky to get perhaps the weakest team in the entire tournament as their first opposition so things worked out that way uh, it was also interesting to see uh, that that little photograph that i think by now everyone would have seen of uh, putin uh, the saudi amir and uh, mr infantino in, in, in the middle as uh, the the patrons of uh, world football as it were but not so much in riyadh i guess because there were news doing the rounds that saudi players would be penalized they even in fact marked three four players in the in the mix saying that they would be uh, penalized for the big loss but uh, uh, that's unfair when you look at it as sports journalists when we cover events we know what it takes for the players to perform at that high level and one team wins one team loses sometimes you know, i i was taken back to the big loss brazil suffered by the hands of germany in the last world cup and imagine brazilian government punishing five of its players for instance so any discussion on that that happened from the saudi fans or someone you met or from the players or coaches it seemed that the saudi fans that traveled to uh, watch the game were of um, upper middle class or maybe rich uh, sort of economic strata uh, they so they were staying in a lot of them were staying it, it was sort of organized tours they were staying in the bigger hotels in in moscow uh, they went on dedicated buses from these hotels to the stadium and back so they were not i mean hundreds of saudis out on the streets uh, partying with the general population as it were uh, so i i don't know what exactly they felt about it but the few that i did speak to at the stadium itself after the match didn't seem at all disappointed or um, kind of distraught at their team's performance they're just happy to be a part of the world cup so what i have this is a theory that i have mulled and spoken about with others as well that 2002 was an aberration in a way because it was hosted in what do you think about that and uh, post that in the next 16 years or so things look 
backwards and forward for Asian teams. Uh, anyways, through the co course of the tournament, I guess that kind of discussion will we'll have how the Asian teams are faring and hopefully one of yeah. those teams might reach the quarters and may go forward as well, hopefully. Yeah, it stops being a footballing discussion very quickly because a lot of this has to do with sort of uh, international labor laws and shit like that. Sorry, uh, stuff like that. Um, because unless Asian players have the opportunity to play in the best leagues in the world, for example, uh, the Korean guy who plays at Spurs, or some players uh, do manage to get out. Um, but unless large numbers of Asian players are able to play in these top leagues, the standard of Asian football cannot go up. All of us, I mean, we, we watch the UEFA Champions League. I think even though we are, I am a football journalist, I pay very little attention to the Asian Champions League. It's of almost uh, no consequence to my life, which is a bit, uh, I mean, it's sort of a chicken egg cycle that uh, perpetuates itself. So, uh, maybe with the money that's coming into the game and like the Chinese league attracting all these players, uh, some players, like even the Indian Super League, for example, is attracting slightly better, uh, more skilled, more experienced or more talented foreign players. Over time, maybe in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, by the time India qualifies for a World Cup in 2030 or 2034 or whenever it happens, by then maybe Asian league competitions, Asian club competitions will be better and, and therefore the national teams will be better. But given the current environment with, with Europeans, the job market being the way it is, I don't see uh, the progress being very rapid. Uh, you mentioned about players making it to bigger leagues so that they uh, do, do uh, improve their standard and reach up there. So, Africa has benefited from that, I believe. So, again, you can immediate comparison should be made with Africa, I feel, rather than Europe or uh, South America. So, what do you think about the African standards that have, uh, from the 90s, I guess, it has improved drastically and uh, where does Asia stand compared to Africa as of now? Anyway, uh, what I am trying to say is that the the leagues or the setup or the money flowing in in Asian football is much higher than what it is in Africa, but still mm -hmm. uh, disparity is there. True. Um, again, in Africa, uh, I don't know. So if you look at this tournament, um, the majority of the African teams that are there are North African teams, right? Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt. Uh, these countries are economically well off. Uh, their domestic leagues are strong. The their infrastructure is strong. Morocco was in the running for uh, was among the final two bids for the 2026 World Cup, which was decided uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the day before the tournament started. In fact, and it's unfortunate that the direction in which international football is going is everything is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it, it's it is impossible for a country like morocco to uh, perhaps host 48 international teams because it it then means not just stadium where the matches happen but uh, training bases for 48 teams now where is a country of the size of morocco going to create world class training facilities for 48 international teams to come and live and train and do all of the drama that goes with being a World Cup squad. You know, it's a, there's a lot of like drama and nonsense that also happens uh, in, in these big situations. So, uh, yeah, I don't, in terms of quality and, and sort of Africa benefits in the sense that Many European nations manage to swipe away a lot of their best talent because of historical colonial ties, etc., etc. It's a little bit easier for or language even. So it's, for example, 
may be easier for uh, an Algerian footballer to move to France and benefit from the club and training structure in France than it would be for someone from Korea. Maybe. Or India, for example. You mentioned earlier that uh, Russia, Russians are more keen on the PR that they are going to get out of this tournament, that real Russia would be brought out, that they are not a vodka drinking uh, country celebrating life as such, but I am sure they know how to celebrate life. But then uh, the predominant media in the world, the English media, have been going going around talking about hooliganism and how the English fans are staying away, so not, not because the, they are afraid that the side might do badly, but because they are afraid of the <laughs> Russian hooligans and they have a history of rivalry, fights rather. So, being on, on the ground there, what do you perceive about the Russian fans and what do you feel the scene is as far as safety of the fans are concerned, the visiting fans, the away fans? Um, it's extremely safe. Uh, the security measures that are in place for the World Cup. And it's a, actually, it's quite an interesting question because there's a lot of police that you can do whatever you want. Like we talk about freedom, etc., etc. But unlike uh, if you go to, for example, a public event in Delhi, right? There will be some Delhi police guy constantly fingering. Ye mat karo, wo mat karo, yahan mat jao, yahan mat betho. You know, like that. Here, the cops are there, but they are there to observe and only interfere or get involved, intervene when there is an issue, when some problem happens. Right? Otherwise, um, they are happy to stand around and watch and do their jobs and finish their shift and go back home. So. <laughs> So the uh, so it's that way, and people are uh, in general. I think over the years, whether it's uh, because of how things were during communist times in Russia, Soviet Russia, or um, or just a general cultural thing, people are quite. There's a high level of self-discipline. Uh, so like people will not chuck things. I mean, even if you smoke a cigarette, the guy will put it out and then find a bin to put the button. You know, that, that kind of um, self-motivation is existent here. So, so I think fans are, I, again, it's not a blanket statement because England fans, I, I can, cannot vouch for. Because they, like you said, rivalry, uh, who thinks, who is the bigger dog in the fight? Uh, that scene is there for sure, but I find it extremely hard to imagine the kind of scenes that uh, that I saw in, in Marseille, for example, two years ago. I don't think anything like that is going to happen here. Uh, it's just they'll shut it down way before it gets to to that stage. And the other, the other thing that has been talked about consistently is the safety of uh, LGBT fans. Um, and for example, they, I think England uh, gay fans traveling to support the English team have been told not to display their sexuality in public, etc., etc. If you're traveling to Russia to watch the games, you should take the same precautions that you would while you were traveling to when you if you were traveling to a big event anywhere in the world. To wind this discussion today, I would like to get into another pertinent point that has been discussed. I mean, right before the tournament, and right now it's just started, I believe. We are mm -hmm. so you were there at the stands when the first we are decision was made at the World Cup. So your take on that plus. Generally, what what has what have we been hearing about the technology and how it's been implemented at the World Cup? Um, at the post-match press conference, one of the French journalists asked Didier Deschamps, the France coach, 
this, this question. He said uh, VAR and uh, goal line technology, right? Because the second goal was uh, verified by the goal line technology. So would he consider this a 21st century victory? Um, the coach didn't really answer the question, but I, but I think the question itself sums up the direction in which football is heading. So you cannot deny. Uh, I mean, if every other sport is adopting technology in different ways, there is no way that football can be outside of that conversation. How it happened the first time was a bit bizarre. Firstly, they are showing it on the big screens uh, at the stadium. So when the process is going on, fans are involved in it. It's not that uh, some guy goes to a room in the corner or is having a conversation on the microphone with, with some other guy in some other room. Uh, but the ref goes to the side to look at the screen. And at the same time, uh, they show it on the big screen so that people inside the stadium can see what's going on. How it went down in this particular incident, I thought was a bit strange because a decision was taken and then play was brought back. So it brings into question all the subjective elements of the use of technology, which is an unending debate with no answers. So. So, there is this point that uh, brings to the fore the entire debate. You mentioned how referees look at it and referee at a moment of self-doubt in a way. So, does it dent the confidence of the referee uh, because he knows that he would be under scrutiny and he would be, I mean, there would, referee in tradition is the ultimate voice on the football pitch. He decides and that's it, right? And now there is something which would supersede him. So he is, is he insecure? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think that most referees, I mean, the, the refs that I've spoken to at least, are looking at it as an essential part of their job going forward. Uh, and the quicker they are to understand how this technology works and how it can be utilized and how it translates into real situations on the pitch, the better they will do as referees. So I don't think that that there is that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like if you compare it to cricket, right? There, there was a time when these third umpire decisions were rare. You know, I would, now everything I would. is referred. Every run out, every, every wicket they check if there is overstepping. I mean, the natural tendency to maybe not, maybe a ref can all, all, or an umpire in, in cricket can be like, okay, yeah, the TV replay hai na, so why do I need to be on the ball all the time? Man? 10 minutes ka nap le le tham beech mein, kya, kya dikkat hai? So, I believe that is happening and uh, quality of umpiring probably I mean, they were legendary um, umpires in cricket and now not anymore, I would say. But yeah, that brings us, let's get back to uh, football and uh, what is the endearing image of week one of the World Cup? I think because it's early in the tournament, it, everything has not become so critical and so serious in terms of the football yet. So, uh, we've had, those of us who are here have had the time and I mean, I'm not all of us, but some of us have had the time to get to meet some Russian people and build some relationships. And to me, like the warmth and hospitality of the people here is the enduring image of not only week one, but it's likely to be of the whole tournament unless my my team wins it. Uh, Mary the three team hashtag. <laughs> Uh, but but that that that's what I mean. Like it's really remarkable the kind of um, like it's a European country, but the people are very much Eastern in their philosophy, in their hospitality, and in their uh, general way of being. 
it's early days in the World Cup. It's just been uh, not even a week, almost a week. So by the time we catch up with Siddhant, who would be uh, going to other cities, uh, catching up some uh, great action there. Uh, there would be a clarity on who would get out of the group, who would have made it, who would not, who would not have. Questions would be answered like, will Germany, after the disappointment, will they make it? And uh, how will England fare? Uh, so all these things would be answered by the time we catch up with Sudan next time. And uh, so till then, have fun Sudan. Uh, keep meeting people. Find out more about Russia for us.